Hello, computational music analysts. I'm going to talk a little bit today about some topics that are not in themselves essentially computational, although having a computer helps, but are really about the intersection of mathematical and quantitative thinking with music analysis, music theory, and musicology, or the study of music history. And these are some of the things that I've done in my own research that I hope will make you think about some ways that data analysis can go beyond the score and tell us something more about the history of music. When I'm not doing computational music analysis, my other job is as a medieval music researcher. And one of the certainties I was always taught um, about medieval music is that we've lost most of it. We've lost so much of it. And I mean, it's it's just incredible how much we have. In fact, most people always said that um, the, the music that survives is just the tip of the iceberg. It was first said by a very important medieval histo uh, musicologist, Nino Perotta, uh, but this term was picked up from on by dozens of other people. And so um, when we think about what's lost, it could be number of manuscripts that's lost, or it could be things that um, were lost because they were never written down and we've forgotten them. But if we want to think about even the things that were once written down, uh, songs that were once written down, the pieces that were once written down, uh, how many of them do we no longer have any copy of at all? Um, what is the tip of the iceberg? Uh, is it 90%? That's what a lot of people say, uh, you know, the visible part of the iceberg is. Is it 99% you know, lost? 99.9% uh, .9 lost? Or as one person said, basically everything. So I'll call that 99.9999%. My friend and former teacher, Sean Gallagher, once asked me, hey, would there be any way, you know, you're a math guy, to prove this, to show that it's true? And, you know, I immediately said, no, you know, there's no way we could do this. Then I thought a little bit more and realized there are people who look at, um, you know, how things get lost and stuff. I, uh, later on, I found this great article on um, what happens in peer-to-peer -peer song sharing uh, when you just start disconnecting lots of computers from the network as happened during the crackdown on Napsters and things like that. And, um, and they showed that as you go from, if you have 100,000 computers on a network, you might have 5 million songs. Uh, but if the network gets down to, you know, maybe 10,000 or 15,000 computers, you only lose about half the song. So that was kind of interesting to me. That was a little bit counterintuitive that you could really lose a lot of nodes on a network and not lose a lot of the content there. And I kind of thought, well, you know, computers might be something like medieval manuscripts that we lose a bunch, but maybe we still have the songs. So I wrote two articles about this topic. First um, is what I'm really going to be talking about now. Uh, it's an article called Tipping the Iceberg in a journal called Musica Disciplina. And another, it's a little bit harder to find. Uh, it's called Monks, Manuscripts, and Other Peer-to-Peer -peer Song Sharing Networks of the Middle Ages. It's in a great uh, book that the University of Pennsylvania uh, helped publish called Contus Scriptus Technologies of Medieval Song. I like the idea of technology uh, existing throughout history. Anyhow, so one of the ways that we could do this is just, you know, look at all the records of missing pieces and see how many of them we have. And that's kind of sarcastic, but there are things uh, that exist in the world like this. Um, there's a manuscript. It's actually only, uh, I think, two or four pages survive now um, that was owned by the Duchess of Tremoyil, so it's often called the Tremoyil uh, manuscript. It's in um, it's in the National Library of Paris now. And if you look at this manuscript, uh, what what we only have a couple pages of it, but we have the entire index, the table of contents that tells you uh, what the names of the pieces are and what page they would have been on in the original manuscript. So we can look at, well, 
we don't have this manuscript, but how many of these pieces do we have we have we lost? So we can see that uh, I've marked here. These are all the pieces that we're pretty sure we don't have copies of. And um, here's all the pieces that we're pretty sure we do have copies of. And there's some pieces that we can't really be sure. They're um, parts of medieval music traditions like the mass that have these somewhat generic names uh, like credo or something kind of like if we saw oh we lost symphony well you know who who symphony things like that um, so when we overlay these two together we see that actually those that survive really outrank those that don't so in this particular index we have 114 compositions that um of, of which 109 are identifiable, and 68% of them seem to survive. Or another thing that I looked at was this collection of um, sonnets by a kind of cool but uh, second tier Italian poet named Prodanzani. And one of the things that, um, that makes a lot of people think he's second tier is he throws in a lot of his songs just uh, lists of things, lists of all the food they eat, ate, lists of all the dances they, they danced that day. And in this particular case, a list of all the songs that were sung, it begins at the top of, kind of kind of nice for where we're about to be in the year, uh, with the violin, viola, something. They made all the May songs, like Rosette qui non cambi mai color, the rose that never changes its colors, je suis n'offre ton fort, dolce sapore, etc., etc. And we can basically figure out which ones of these um, things are titles of songs. And then we can see how many of them we know. So Rosette qui non cambi mai color is a song that survives. Um, so, is, so is je suis n'offre ton fort. Uh, but some of them, like uh, toward the bottom, Costai sarebbe bella in paradiso. Uh, we don't know that song. So we can look over and again, we can see how many of them survive, how many of them don't survive. And then these other four, um, where we can argue about um, that there's songs with similar titles. Are they just being misquoted or um, are they the same? Or is this really a song? Things like that. So uh, it's these are the two proportions that it could be. So depending on what we look at, there's somewhere between 16 and 17 compositions and three to, to seven of them are lost, 10 to 12 survive. Um, it, so that's about 59 to 75% of the songs here survive. If we look at all of the sonnets in this collection by Prodanzani, there's 59 identifiable compositions and 40 of them survive. So that's 71%. So here's two pieces of evidence, um, both from textual sources, to try to see uh, how, how much survives or how much doesn't. But can, can we do better? One of the things I thought of was that there are people who spend a lot of time trying to count things that are difficult to count because you can't sort of capture them all. Uh, they're the animal population biologists. Um, they are people who go out and um, they can't capture every deer in a forest. So what do they do? They um, they might go out. Here's one way that they do it. They might go out at a certain point and go and um, capture, you know, all the deer they can capture in a couple of days. Um, you know, maybe it's, let's say it's 10, 10 deer. And they go and they tag the deer in some way or something somehow somehow they you know so they can recognize the same deer again then maybe you know they let a month go by or something not too long but you know more enough time that animals can move around and stuff and then they go out and they capture deer for a day again and let's say you know they capture 10 deer again so, uh, the point is the second time they do a capture this is called capture recapture methods the second time they do it they look to see how many of the deer that we captured the second time did we also capture the first time? And if you think about it, if you go into a forest and you know you you walked around pretty randomly or something, and you all of the deer or nine out of the ten deer that you capture the first time, you see the same ones the second time. You might think, wow, 
we've seen almost all the deer in the forest. On the other hand, let's say you capture 10 deer and none of them uh, that you captured the second time had the tags. You'd be like, wow, okay, I know I've seen 20 deer here, but law of averages suggests there's a lot more than 20 deer. And in fact, there's, um, there's formulas that you, you can, uh, that people do with this type of thing. Um, so I tried to figure out, you know, what would be the equivalent in, in music. And so, um, I started to think, you know, uh, let's go and look at some equations we might make. Uh, if we had the number of pieces, if we knew the number of pieces that originally existed, and we multiplied by the probability that any given piece would be missing, we would know the total number of missing pieces. That's fantastic. That is a very hard, uh, equation is very hard to argue against, but it's completely useless, right? We don't know the number of pieces originally. We don't know the probability that any given piece would be missing, and therefore we don't know how many missing pieces are. So one equation, three unknowns, we don't know any of them. But we can think through some of the things here. Um, I'm going to go through a quicker version of this, but I have elsewhere, uh, well, I have in my article um, a little bit deeper version that talks about all the, un, um, the assumptions that could be in play. But let's start with um, how can we figure out the probability that we're missing a given piece? Well, here's one model, and it's, it's kind of a um, it's kind of a bad assumption maybe to start with, but here's one model. Uh, what if there's just medieval scribes had baskets of pieces, you know, just all the pieces, they knew them all in their head, there's something like that, and they kind of randomly chose ones that they were going to write down. Well, then the probability that a given piece would be in a particular manuscript is approximately um, the proportion of all of the pieces in the manuscript. That is, if R sub I is the number of pieces in the manuscript and N is the total number of pieces originally copied, then we would know the probability that a piece would be in a given manuscript or songbook. It's not exactly that number because you don't do duplication, but, but it's pretty close. Um, uh, it's actually, the people have argued against me that, you know, like, well, you have to correct for that error, but you only have to correct for the probability of duplication if, um, if the number of pieces in that manuscript is very, is close to uh, some major uh, percentage of the total number of pieces originally copied. So um, that's already kind of getting that. Anyhow, so this is the probability that a given piece would be in a given manuscript. From here, we can work out what's the probability the piece is not in a given manuscript, and we just subtract that from one. Great. So that's, that's pretty good. Now let's say you have two independent manuscripts. They're being copied in different places, you know, different people, whatever, something like that. What would be the probability that the piece would not be in any of these two manuscripts? And so you just multiply the probability that it wouldn't be in one manuscript and not in the other. And so R sub one and R sub two, they're gonna depend on how many pieces are in the manuscript. But this would be the probability that some piece existing or not would be in would not be in any of two manuscripts. So there's about 85 surviving medieval manuscripts from the period I'm most interested in, um, sort of Italy from 1370 to 1420, uh, just after the Black Death and um, during the time of the Great Papal Schism. So there's about 85 of these manuscripts. So what's the probability that any given piece would not be in any of the 85 surviving manuscripts? And it looks something like this. Um, so this is something, you know, that's, it's a, it's a big, long, um, number, but you can see that at, right at the very end, this, whatever this works out to is the equal to the probability that a piece would be missing. Cause if it, a piece is not in any of the surviving manuscripts, then it's missing to us today. So this is kind of great. We know all these R numbers because they're simply the number of pieces in a manuscript today, um, not in originally something. So we can take this and we can 
go back to our original equation with three unknowns and um, substitute it into for that P of M place. So we can see that now we have one equation and two unknowns. Um, it's still a pretty you know, punking equation, but, um, but that's good. One equation, two unknowns, still too many unknowns, right? We need two equations at least if we're gonna do two unknowns. But we can look at this last answer, this M. What are the total number of missing pieces? Well, the total number of missing pieces is just the number of pieces that originally existed, which we don't know, minus the number of pieces that survive, which we do know. If we have a pretty good catalog of everything that survives today, then we can figure that out. So now we go back and we see that we have actually just one equation and one unknown. Uh, it's a pretty big equation. Um, and in fact, a lot of the literature that I was reading from the 60s and 70s and 80s was about, okay, you can't possibly solve an equation you know, of this dimensionality uh, exactly. So here's all the sophisticated math that we can do to um, to try to um, you know, to try to approximate it. But in fact, nowadays it's it's pretty simple. What we can do is we can try different numbers for n, the number of original pieces, starting from you know one more than the number of surviving pieces or something. Try all these numbers into here until the left side and the right side approximately balance. And we can do that with computers. So uh, when I did this, I mean, it's uh, this is article I think like 13, 14 years old. Uh, it's before uh, before Python was big. So I used Perl, and I just did find um, find n, find the hypothetical total number of many scripts given all the things that we know, and so on, so on, and um, we're able for each of um, four different. Uh, genres, these are different types of music, we're able to figure out what percentage of the pieces are probably missing. These are, you know, I'm, uh, there's error bars on this, this is rough guesses, um, but we can see that the percentage of missing pieces may be in only one in only one of the genres is it predicted to be more than the number of total number of pieces. Uh, than you know than the number of surviving pieces. And in fact, for some of these genres, we predict that hey, we have almost everything there. Um, so, one of the things we can look at instead of saying uh, how many pieces were once copied but no longer exist, we can take that total number and say, wow, maybe we have all but twenty five percent of them. Now, there were a lot of assumptions that went into that, um, that scribes are collecting things randomly and so on and so forth, and that, you know, that there's not pieces that are more popular than each other and so on. And so in the article that I wrote, there's um, ways that you can compensate for this and ways that we can test. For instance, we can hold out 10% um, of the manuscripts at random and then say not just how many pieces would, um, would we expect to um, would you know would we expect were lost? But if we gained ten more manuscripts, how many more pieces would we expect to have that we didn't know already? And then we can look at okay, now put those ten manuscripts back, and voila! Uh, I think I can't remember off the top of my head right now. I you know one of those things I publish it, so I don't have to remember. But uh, I think that the percentage of pieces that were lost, uh, I think I think it was you know within ten percent of something or so so these models were pretty pretty good so we can use this mathematical thinking and just a little bit of programming to answer questions that were thought to be completely unanswerable in history thanks